the, there were products and services that Nokia was able to deliver, which was, and they tested it out in India, and it took off very well. One of the, the innovations they did was they observed that the uh, people in remote areas needed torches because the street lights were not there. So they improvised, they, they innovated by putting a small lamp in, in the uh, feature phone that, that used to be there. And it took off because people needed a torch, they didn't have to carry two things, and the mobile phone which had a torch was something that was useful. When that took off in India, they realized that many other countries also asked for it. Many other emerging economies, they had the similar situations, and they also, people asked for it, so there was a huge demand for uh, an innovation of that kind. For less than 50 cents, Nokia introduced a service for farmers in remote localities to, to get local weather, commodity prices, which is of interest to them, and a whole host of information. All they had to pay at that time was about 30 rupees, which is uh, probably at that time Singapore dollars, probably maybe 60, 70 cents. Today it's, it's, more, it's closer to, to, to 50 cents. Monthly subscription. And they would get all these data. And the weather forecast was not like what the television was showing that like, you know, Delhi has got this weather and Bombay has this weather. Hey, the farmer says like, I'm living in this remote area, tell me my weather, what's going to be for the next week. And the Nokia, because they worked with the meteorological department, had this package which would come through on their mobile phone that gave local weather. It also, so if you are, because it knew your location, it would give you the uh, prices which were relevant for you. You could pick and choose the commodity prices. So for example, if you're in the chili growing area or in a sugar cane growing area, and based on that, you could pick a, a menu of commodity prices, agree for commodity prices, and that would give prices in the nearby wholesale market uh, as of the previous day, closing rates, and India's large agricultural market, what was the closing rates, and if it was a commodity trader on Chicago Board of Trade, then that also would be available. So suddenly, the farmer had the prices on his mobile phone, which previously they didn't have. They were dependent on middlemen. Now they, could, they had the information to even talk to the middlemen and negotiate with the middlemen. And this event even even beyond. How many of us have problem with Singtel and Starhub when we go to the to to sort of edges of Singapore? We go to maybe Changi, right? You know that, right? Like like we go to somewhere in the edges and then you suddenly start getting Malaysian signals and Indonesian signals and things like that. Indian phone signals were not only at the land but they were available. The signals were powerful enough to be caught in the seas. So, so the fishermen would go out with their mobile phone and early morning when they had their catch and were coming back, and this happened in the states of Kerala in, in the south. So on the way back, the fishermen would call the couple of fish markets nearby and ask what was the going rate that morning. And whichever wholesale market offered them a better price the boats will start going towards that. This is School of Economics and Social Science, right? So what would happen now in the, in, the, in the other fish markets? Those who gave lower prices, what would they do? They will? They will increase. So these guys can turn their boats or get fresh bids. So suddenly, the thing that they were used to was that they would bring their catch, and fish is a perishable commodity. So at arrival time, you'll have a price, and an hour or two later, the prices will start falling as the fish is no more fresh and probably begins to rot. The prices will fall. But instead, the power was with the fisherman, because he was picking and choosing which wholesale market he would go to, which were not like too far away, and he would land the boats there. And so suddenly the whole thing started changing. So these kinds of information, these kinds of empowering of the people started happening. And from a product angle, these were things that features that you try out and test out in India is relevant for the rest of the market. So like for example, Singapore often says that like, you know, if you want to enter ASEAN, try out your products and services in Singapore, it's a nice test bed and, and then, then you take it to other countries. You know, this is the thing that you would hear from EDB and other uh, uh, i.e. Singapore and so on and so forth. So that's, so in India's case is because it's a huge test bed for emerging markets and people have time and again found that what works there, 
is relevant for many other emerging economies. So, and when we talk about all these consumers and uh, the uh, their preferences, there's also the local taste, right? And because of the market size and the increase in disposable income, now you find that there's so much of customization that is happening in in, in a, by the multinational corporations, the fast food giants in India. So your McDonald's doesn't only do it for Singapore because our disposable income is much higher. It's not that only in Singapore they do nasi lemak burger. So they do they do vegetarian burgers in India. And they also found that when they developed these products in that market, they could ship it out to Europe or other places where people who had preferences for vegan and vegetarian products. So, so they could expand those markets. And other things people are localizing and customizing to be the the local people's taste because there is a substantial market to be to be had. And products developed for India, the more examples uh, and which which were picked up in other countries. So people customize companies, especially the Korean companies, made that initiative to to develop the products which were more locally relevant and may ensure that and that helped them and gave them a good lead in, in, uh, compared to many others in the, in, the, in the market. And as the rural market is, is picking up, it's not all the stories of like, you know, urban India. The, the rural Indian consumption rate has also been growing. And uh, there are certain uh, states which are doing exceedingly well. And uh, those, those are the states where McKinsey and others say that like, you know, focus on marketing if you are a foreign company, foreign uh, entity wanting to enter India. And, uh, and that's, that's an important thing to, to know about in, in, that, in that country. That while you have broad national statistics which look quite small and low in terms of whether refrigerators or air conditioners or anything else, but there are regions in India where the averages are pretty good. So there are possibilities for you to market in certain parts of India which are very different from the national averages. So don't get caught up only with national averages. Look at na regional figures in that country, and then you will see that, that there are uh, regions to, to focus on. The urban-rural divide is narrowing, so that, that, that's a good news if you're an uh, FMCG or uh, you know, uh, other consumer goods manufacturer. So rural areas have a good potential, because that will be the next takeoff um, as, as urban gets more and more crowded. How do you reach these, these rural communities? Right? One is to say that, hey, go rural, go rural, and, and there is good prospect for it. But companies are making real effort to, to reach out to the rural customers. And uh, they, they work with women's self-help groups. They work with, uh, uh, that's, that's Hindustan Liva, Unilever. Unilever has a women's self-help group with whom they, they work. And, uh, uh, the Tadas for their tea have uh, mechanisms to promote in the rural areas. And uh, maybe I'll share with you one video to show the, how you communicate and how you can communicate innovatively uh, with the uh, rural Indian consumers. Diarrhea still kills 1.1 million children annually in developing countries. Lifeboy believes this can be averted. The Mahakumbh Mela India 2013, the largest religious festival on the planet. Over a hundred million people come here to pray together, live together, and eat together. Life Boy So saw this as the perfect opportunity to convey an important message. Always wash your hands with soap before you eat. Our medium, the roti or Indian bread, served with almost every Indian meal. And the only way to eat it is with your hands. We created a heat stamp 
capable of leaving a simple message on a roti. Did you wash your hands with Life Boy? And over 30 days, a team of 100 people stood in 100 kitchens, stamping over 2.5 million fresh rotis. Helping us to reach out to over 5 million visitors at the Maha Kumbh Mela. So, will people remember to wash their hands before their next meal? Let's pray they do. So, if you ask a question like, you know, how do you reach out to these people? Many of them are illiterates. They are, you know, or even if they are literates, how do you get that mass message out? And you know that that that, that the festival that they're talking about is huge the population. So they, they, there's a whole city that comes up. Harvard University sent with the business school, the medical school, all of them sent teams to study because this happens once in 12 years. So they said that there are a lot of lessons to learn. How there are no major stampedes, no major deaths, uh, no ma how do they manage? And Because it's not an established city. It just springs up for a few days and then it is dismantled. So they said that there are a lot of lessons to learn for the rest of the world about uh, you know, disaster relief or, you know, or any other large congregation. So Howard went and documented the whole thing from you know, different teams, went looked at different aspects of it, the health, the sanitation, the business school, went, the, the social sciences. All of them went and studied and they have, they have written cases about how it is managed for, for various things, you know, whether it's security, for building, for health and sanitary, Whatever it is, so, so, so they come out with creative ways, innovative ways to reach out to that kind of a large population. And what's the scope? What's the potential? Where does where does India go from from here? Right? In uh, about twelve years ago, India was not even a trillion dollar economy. Nine years later. It became two trillion dollar economy. That was 2014. So the same thing happens in another six years. There should be a five trillion dollar economy. And I need to put this five trillion dollar in context. Japan today is a five trillion dollar economy. China, ten trillion. EU is 18, US is 17. So that's where most probably India is heading to. Someone is taking this seriously. This is two weeks old news, that's all. He had already committed two billion dollars a couple of years back. Now he has said that his investment would be five billion dollars. And they have been growing in India. They have 30, 13 million cubic feet of warehouse spread across the country. The large fulfillment centers is 400,000 square feet. They have had year on year revenue growth, very significant. And there are some couple of interesting things that they are doing there. Here you know, in India, the, the cost of setting up the infrastructure and everything is expensive. Labor is cheap, which is the reverse of what it is in many of the major economies. That's number one. I don't know if any of you have read this recent, this kid, the second news came out the last couple of days that Amazon in developed markets is going to try out its own delivery services. Now they are dependent on FedEx and UPS. You can Google this, feel free and check it out. I have no problem with you Googling and I'm checking out what I say. Uh, and what they have 
said in that in that news item, they are trying out their own delivery services, and that's what their Amazon is working on. And uh, the FedEx and UPS have refused to comment on that news item. And uh, but what what is generally believed is that they would Amazon would sort and decide how the delivery should go, and may still use UPS and others not for those things, but just to go and deliver. So they would reduce the the thing that uh, UPS and FedEx would do, maybe the last physically finding people to go and deliver, they may leave for them, but they would have their own, take their decisions on how, which parcels will go in which route, etc., etc. Why am I talking about this, what they would do in the, in the US? Because that's what they have tested in India, and that, testing and that learning that they have had in India is what they are taking to to the US and and other markets subsequently <coughs> that they would deploy. So that's where they are learning and this is the test bed that they are trying out because these are more difficult markets to, to grapple with and uh, they are learning there, they are experiencing things and they perfect it and then they would unleash it in, in uh, markets like uh, to Europe and America. So that's that's what is coming. Yes, go ahead. this is an opinion based question. Although Amazon is the market leader in India at the moment, but with SoftBank investing in Flipkart and also trying for the Snapdeal and Flipkart merger, mm -hmm. don't you think that SoftBank's like past history states that it tends to drive away the market leader when it invests in the second and the third best? So will it happen? Will mark will Amazon be moved from the market? Don't know. You know, if I could Bet on that, then I would probably not be giving talks here. Put my money bet on it, and then probably go and sit in Caribbean island. No, maybe they are a hurricane now. It may not be Caribbean island, but somewhere else. Maybe Bali. I don't know. But somewhere I'll pick a place and probably go and sit there if I can predict that. But anyway, uh, jokes apart, we will have to see. Right? Past is not necessarily a good indicator of what it is. Amazon may win. I'm not taking any sides. I would, uh, you know, I would probably put up Flipkart's uh, stats as as easily because I'm agnostic. I mean, I'm not married to Flipkart or or to Amazon. I don't care, right? So, so there, there was a guest talk with the uh, School of Information Systems uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, the uh, for the entrepreneurship, and they wanted to know about the Indian startups, and I spoke about what Flipkart has done. So, and. Uh, I have friends there and I even got them to, to give me some stats to talk about it. So I'm, I'm fine with that. But the fact is, the message to be taken is, if SoftBank and Amazon take India seriously, maybe we should also look at it seriously, right? Does it, does it have problems? Yes, it has problems. That's also because in India, they themselves highlight the problems first thing in the front page of the newspaper or, or the television. You don't need CNN and BBC to come and highlight the problems of that country. The local media itself will do it on the first front page and headline news and things like that. So, so everybody knows about problems of India rather than the prospects. So I'm not doing a PR job, but I'm just wanting to highlight some of the things that we normally don't read or get to know about, and there are business opportunities. And the powers of, that be in Singapore do know it. The Temasex and the GLCs have invested. Go and look up what are the Indian companies they have invested. They have invested deep, not only in the, you know, the, like like Singtel owns 30% of the Indian telecom company, but the Airtel, not only that top line, but at the, at the, at the deeper level, they have invested in many companies which are uh, in, you know, providing services in growth areas, uh, providing <coughs> manufacturing facilities in certain areas which they think have a good prospects things that will be related to education, things that are related to uh, distribution, things that are related to uh, storage, logistics, distribution in agri-products, non-agri-product, cold storage. So the people that need to know it, Singapore know it and they do invest in the thing. So in the fight between uh, Amazon and uh, Flipkart, I don't know. I, I don't know which, which who will win. And I have no preferences, whoever wins. As long as the small business is not getting killed, but actually they get benefit out of that, I'm fine with that. And maybe both there, there is room for two players. I don't know. Let them let them survive, right? What what do what do I care?
it's it's difficult for me to predict. I don't think even even uh, SoftBank or Jeff Bezos <coughs> are are able to predict. They know that they have to do it and they have to execute it. That's all. So that's a summary. That uh, it's a high consumption, high investment, high growth rate mode. It's it's still there and uh, it has adapted. <coughs> and uh, this is a market where you can sort of localize and global products and customize and then try it out because it's not only for India, which is a large market, but you could learn from that and take it to other markets. And it's got the demographic, so you have the young population, there's still the possibility for future and they have a lot of aspirations. And uh, they believe in themselves, and which is, which is good. Uh, they are not uh, sort of uh, pessimistic about the future. So, I'm <coughs> open to take questions. <coughs>